Hello AP Macro students, I'm Mr. Sanabria and today is our class on unemployment. So finally we're going to figure out uh, who exactly are the unemployed. Now one thing uh, I want to note here at the beginning of this video is that because of time constraints and the pace that we have to move through the course, um, I did ask you to watch the video. Um, it was a lecture uh, on YouTube um, on your own and take notes before this class. So if you haven't watched that uh, that video, which was the homework from last time, and taking your notes, go ahead and do that now before you watch this, because I'm going to proceed through this uh, this lecture as if you had already seen the previous one. So I will be reviewing a little bit from that, uh, but I really need you to see that video because it goes into greater detail on um, the types of unemployment, which is actually where we're going to start. We'll start here with a review of the types of unemployment. Um, assuming that at this point you've now seen, uh, you've now seen the other video. Uh, the, what I want to do real quick though is to put the course in perspective for a moment of where we're at with things. Uh, we we talked all about uh, GDP for the last couple of uh, videos, if you will, uh, because we're beginning to measure the economy. Okay, so we kind of ended the first unit by introducing the business cycle, which is, uh, you know, the economy over time and its growth and its contractions, you know, boom and bust cycle, recessions and um, expansions, etc. Um, and now we're drilling into the exact measurements that we use. And these are known as the three economic measures. And when you're talking about the economy and how healthy it is or how unhealthy it is, what we're talking about are these three economic measures. And so GDP is um, the economic measure for growth, right, or size. It's our aggregate measure of production. And now we're on, on unemployment, and unemployment is... Uh, a measure of the health of the jobs market, right? And then the last economic uh, measure is going to be price level, which is measured by the Consumer Price Index, which is a broad uh, measure of prices throughout the economy. So just that's what we're doing. Okay, we're getting we're getting into the weeds on these three economic measures. We've learned all about GDP already. Now we're going to learn all about unemployment. So with that being said, let's go ahead and review the types of unemployment. This is what the video clip that I asked you to watch mainly went over. And so the first type is frictional unemployment. And you'll recall that frictional unemployment is when you're in between jobs. Okay, this is someone who has skills to do something, but hasn't found the right fit. And so one way that you could f not find the right fit is if you are in a employment somewhere, um, let's say you work at a movie theater, and you don't like your boss, creeps you out, so you quit your job. Well, you have the skills to work at a movie theater, but you quit your job, it wasn't the right fit. So you would be, until you find another job, frictionally unemployed. The other way you could not have found the right fit is if you had a job at the movie theater, but you were terrible at it. You weren't any good at being a, a movie theater employee. You show up late every day, you're rude to customers, you're eating popcorn most of the time and giving away free tickets, and you get fired. You weren't a good fit for the employer, and that's important too. So either way, you're just not a good fit. It's frictional unemployment. There's one other way that you could be frictionally unemployed that you'll run into, which is just after you complete some sort of job training. Let's pretend that you just finished college, and you have this credential. You can get a good job, but while you're still looking for that first job, you're frictionally unemployed. You haven't found the right fit. The next one that you'll recall is structural unemployment. Okay? Structural unemployment is when you have some sort of skills, but they have become uh, less desirable than they used to be. Meaning the, the economy, the structure of the economy has changed to where the skills that you have are no longer as relevant as they used to be. The, the labor market doesn't demand your skills. So an example of that might be if you used to make wooden wagon wheels uh, back in the early 1900s. Well, okay, that's a highly skilled job, I'm sure. I have no idea how to make a wagon wheel. It's, it's probably pretty difficult. But when someone invented the rubber tire, suddenly there was this better alternative, and we didn't need people who could make wooden wagon wheels as much anymore. What we need are people who can make rubber tires. So a lot of people who were highly skilled in making wooden wagon wheels lost their jobs. They became unemployed. And the key feature 
to structural unemployment is that they needed to be retrained. So if you're structurally unemployed, it requires that you become retrained or you acquire new skills to become employed. So structural unemployment is needing to get new skills because your skills have been um, be, been made obsolete. It's often kind of the, the machines are taking our jobs kind of unemployment, right? So there's some new invention and it figures, uh, it, it finds a way to do something that people used to do and then they become structurally unemployed. And if you want to just do some independent research on structural unemployment in history, uh, Google the Luddites, okay, the Luddites. Um, that's an interesting story we're not going to get into now, but it deals with structural unemployment and how kind of society can, can respond to that. And then finally, there's this idea of cyclical unemployment, and this is the one that we don't like, all right? This is the one that is bad. This is cyclical, the business cycle. You see, that's the, the cycle in cyclical. They're obviously related. We're talking about the business cycle. So we're talking about with cyclical unemployment, the kind of unemployment that is associated with a recession. Okay, so think back to the business cycle, and a recession is two consecutive quarters of economic contraction. So producers aren't producing as much stuff as they used to be, and because they're not producing as much, they don't employ as many people. People get laid off, they lose their jobs, or people who otherwise would be able to find a job don't get hired because there's not as much economic activity happening, they're cyclically unemployed. And cyclical unemployment is also referred to as macroeconomic unemployment. This is the kind of unemployment that we're trying to stop. Remember, macroeconomics is all about the business cycle and trying to counter the business cycle, trying to flatten out those peaks and those troughs and just have steady economic growth. And since those troughs are associated with higher unemployment, it's cyclical unemployment that we're talking about. So that's a quick recap of the three types of unemployment that you very much need to be familiar with. And what we're going to do now is a quick practice. So go ahead and download the practice sheet that's, that's found right below this video on the website. And go through those. There's only 10 little scenarios, and you need to pick whether or not they're frictional, structural, or cyclical um, examples of unemployment. And then we'll go over that sheet together. So go ahead and do that now. All right, here we are. Let's go over the practice sheet. Uh, at this point, you should have downloaded the sheet that you can find right underneath the video here and uh, answered these 10 scenarios by uh, basically just indicating with a, an F, an S, or a C whether each of these individually, individuals is frictionally, structurally, or cyclically unemployed. So it's a quick practice, but uh, if you can do this, then you pretty much have what you need to know about uh, the types of unemployment. So let's go ahead and go through these one by one. We'll start with uh, number one here, a structural engineer who is laid off because of a recession. Um, if you're laid off because of a recession, that is cyclical unemployment. That's what cyclical unemployment is. It's the business cycle, um, and it's pretty straightforward there. So now we've got a journalist who leaves her job in Austin to look for a new job in Portland. This was a voluntary uh, separation from the, the employment, and also this journalist still has the skills they need to get a new job. They're in between jobs, frictionally unemployed. Number three, we have a recent college graduate looking for her first job. So again, we've got a situation where this is an individual who has skills but hasn't found the right job. It's another case of frictional unemployment. Number four, the invention of a new machine causes a factory worker to lose his job. So this is a situation where the worker must have been doing something that the factory needed, but now there's a machine that does it for um, everyone. So at this point, they don't need him anymore. Unfortunately for this guy, um, he's now structurally unemployed. Now remember, uh, for the economy as a whole, this is probably a good thing, but for the individual who just lost his job, uh, not so much. So now we have number five. Low automobile sales leads the dealership to lay off salespeople. Now this one you might want to be tempted to say structural unemployment, but the fact of the matter is um, it's not that cars have been replaced by something else, it's that the economy has slowed down. And since the economy slowed down and people aren't buying cars at the rate you would think they should or you think they historically would, uh, this is a business cycle issue and this person's cyclically unemployed. 
Number six, a former school teacher refuses to accept a job at the minimum wage rate. So we're going to assume that the former school teacher still has the skills necessary to be a teacher, uh, but won't accept that job at a different rate. Uh, so that's, that would be representative of a bad fit. Okay, so if you don't appreciate the wage rate being offered to you, then you haven't found the right fit, so you would be frictionally unemployed. Number seven, a high school dropout does not have the skills to get a job in the modern economy. So if you're lacking skills that are desired, that is structural unemployment. And I like this because it's showing that um, you don't have to have had skills and then those skills are, are get replaced by something else. It could be the fact that you haven't acquired skills in the first place that are relevant. This is structural unemployment also. Steel workers who are laid off in the United States um, because the U.S. is now importing most of its steel from the Republic of Korea, uh, this would be a situation where the structure of the economy has changed. These people are structurally unemployed. Okay? They have skills. They have the, the skills it takes to work in a steel mill. But the structure of the United States has changed to the point where we're not producing that steel here in the United States, so these people have to find a different job. And now we have the example of a skilled weaver um, who loses her job when a new loom is invented. This is the classic case of a new machine takes over a job that you did, and you're now structurally unemployed. Finally, a restaurant employee leaves due to poor working conditions. This individual uh, hasn't found the right fit, have they? So they are now frictionally unemployed. And that's about it for this practice. Pretty easy, pretty straightforward. As long as you understand these three different types of unemployment, you should be good. And let's get back to the lesson now and uh, figure out who exactly is unemployed. Okay, so we're done with the review, and uh, hopefully you found that easy enough and you understood each of those. If you understand each of those, then you pretty much know what you need to know about identifying the three different types of unemployment. And I do want to layer on a little bit more complexity to this um, by adding seasonal unemployment. It's this kind of a fourth type of unemployment, but it's not something we're going to spend a lot of time thinking about. However, you might run into this, and I want you to understand what, what's being, being spoken about if you see seasonal unemployment. And this is basically exactly what it sounds like. There's certain um, unemployment cycles that have not to do with the business cycle, but to do with seasons. So let's imagine people who harvest crops and they rotate around uh, regions in the country uh, helping to do the, the crop harvest. Well, obviously that's seasonal in nature, right? Some uh, harvests um, are ready at different times of the year. And so you're going to see ebbs and flows of employment in that sort of situation. Also, another big seasonal employment opportunity is retail during the holiday shopping season. You will see a spike in employment in retail sector of the economy during the holiday shopping season. Now, um, what this is, is identifying that that is normal, okay? And so you might see a seasonally adjusted unemployment rate, which would take into account what we would already expect for seasonal unemployment, okay? Now, we're not going to spend too much time talking about seasonal unemployment. Um, like I mentioned before, I just want you to understand what it is, okay? It follows the cycle of the seasons, and it adds and takes away from employment figures throughout the year. So let's talk about the natural rate of unemployment. I told you that we were going to figure out one day why the full employment unemployment rate is 5% instead of zero. And this is why. Frictional and structural unemployment equal 5%, or the natural rate of unemployment also known as full employment. Okay, so we've got three kind of ways of identifying the same thing. Natural rate of unemployment, or 5% unemployment, or full employment. They all mean the same thing. Now, why is frictional and structural unemployment, uh, why are they natural? Well, any economy is going to experience frictional unemployment because that's healthy. You have to be able to be in between jobs. If you don't like your job, you should be able to quit your job and find a different job. Or if you don't want to move or live in Austin, Texas, but you'd rather live in a different state, well, then you quit your job, you're frictionally unemployed, you move to the new place, you find a new job. 
A healthy economy allows the job force to move around like that. It's actually much more efficient. And you're never going to get rid of it. So frictional unemployment is natural, right? Hence natural rate of unemployment. Now what about this structural unemployment? Structural unemployment is also natural, and economists would argue it's healthy because it means that innovation and uh, movement is happening in the economy. We're inventing new machines, we're figuring out different ways of being more productive, and all of this is natural and healthy and a good sign. Now, importantly, and if you looked up the Luddites, you'd understand this, if you are the individual who becomes structurally unemployed, you don't like it one bit. It's terribly inconvenient for you. Um, it's horrible. You have lost your job and now you need to acquire new skills. If it's later in your life, that's, that's daunting. Okay? And so it's not good for individuals who lose their job to structural unemployment. However, the economy as a whole becomes better for it because we've become more productive. An economist would say, yay, good for you. You're now freed up to do something even more productive than you were. Um, so that's frictional plus structural unemployment equals 5%, the full employment unemployment rate. Okay? And here's your reminder that cyclical unemployment is known as macroeconomic unemployment. You'll see that term as well, so you need to know that. So let's finally get on this kind of journey towards understanding who unemployed people are. Who are the unemployed? And it's kind of a long story. So... If you want to know the unemployment rate, you have to understand that it's a percentage, right? And any percentage is a part of a whole. So the unemployed part is a part of what whole? Well, the whole thing is called the labor force, okay? So what percentage of people are unemployed who are part of the labor force as a whole? And to understand this, we first need to create the labor force, okay? Because everybody isn't part of the labor force. In fact, a lot of people aren't part of the labor force. So in order to figure out who's part of the labor force, or who, what the labor force is, and then to figure out who's got a job and who doesn't, we need to start with the entire population of the United States. And I'm going to give us um, a visual example to go with this as we talk about it. So hold on one second. Okay, we're back, and here I am. Magically, I've got this whiteboard with a ton of dots on it, and let's pretend that these dots represent the entire population of the United States. So each dot is a person, or a hundred people. I don't care. But here's all our people, right? <clears throat> we start with the entire population of the United States. And then from that population, we're going to go ahead and subtract people who are under age 16. Now remember that unemployment is meant to be a measure of the health of the economy through jobs, right? And if you have a job and you're 15, that's good for you. Some 15-year-olds some do have a job. But guess what? It doesn't say anything one way or another about the health of the economy if 15-year-olds have a job. Okay, so basically, children don't count as employed. They don't count as unemployed. What they count as is not even eligible to be part of the labor force. And that's how I want you to think of this. this these people, 15 and below, are not eligible to be part of the labor force. They're not even part of the conversation when it comes to counting unemployment. The next group is people who are in the armed forces and institutionalized. Let's talk about the armed forces first. So people who are in the military, they don't count as employed. They don't count as unemployed. They are also not eligible to be part of the labor force. Because how big our military is has to do with our strategic goals um, in the defense of the nation. It doesn't have anything to do with um, the health of the economy, so to, say, so to speak. So even though when you're in the military you get paid and you make a living and you could have a great career in the military, that's not at all counted in the employment or unemployment figures. Okay, It's just simply... Um, not, these are individuals who are not eligible to be part of the labor force to begin with, so they're not part of the conversation. All right, now let's talk about uh, this word institutionalized. So what that means is if you're put into some sort of an institution, such as, uh, you know, some sort of a recovery facility, prison, uh, some sort of a rehab of any kind. All of these are different ways of being institutionalized. And what we're saying here is that we're not going to count these people as part of the labor force at all either. Okay, And what really we're saying is that it's not just that these people aren't part of the labor force, 
is that they're not eligible to be part of the labor force to begin with. So anyone who's not yet 16, anyone who's in the armed forces, and anyone who is institutionalized in any way is not eligible to be part of the labor force to begin with. And so the way I want to illustrate this is we've got our entire population that we started with, and all we're going to do is draw a box around a certain amount of them. So let me draw my box. Okay. Let's pretend that everybody outside of that box is either under 16, in the military, or institutionalized. They aren't part of the conversation at all. So then on the next slide, we're going to only be talking about now the people inside the box. And the people inside the box are referred to as the non-institutional adult civilian population. Okay, That's the non-institutional adult civilian population. But is that our labor force yet? No, it's not. Because you're not part of the labor force unless you're actually participating um, in the labor force. Okay. So first you have to be eligible to be part of the labor force, which is uh, what we've got, the non-institutional adult civilians. And then now you have to be participating in the labor force. So if you're already retired or you're a homemaker, then by your own choice, you're deciding not to have a job. Right? So you are not participating in the labor force. So you don't count as unemployed just because you don't have a job. You just you don't count as part of the labor force. Then you have full-time students who are over the age of 16. This is, this is you, actually. The reason why you don't count as unemployed if you have a job, or if you don't have a job, rather, is because... Um, we don't expect you to have a job if you're a full-time student. You're not part of the labor force. Now, I know many of you are thinking, well, I do have a job and I'm a full-time student. Hey, good for you. But you don't count towards employment either. You don't count one way or another. You're simply not part of the labor force at all. You are not participating. Now, you're different than those 15-year-olds. Uh, you're different than the military, and you're different than the people who are institutionalized because if you weren't a full-time student, well, then you would count as the labor force, but um, you're, you're a full-time student. So when you're in college, it's the same thing. Full-time students in college, even if you work, you don't count as employed. You don't count as unemployed. You just don't count at all. And then you have this idea of discouraged workers, and this is incredibly important. I want you to write it down, underline it, put a star next to it. This is a big deal because discouraged workers are those people who lost their job Okay, due to cyclical unemployment. So there was a downturn in the economy, you lost your job. They looked for a job, looked for a job, looked for a job, and then they couldn't find a job after a certain amount of time and stopped looking altogether. Well, if you're not looking for a job, you are essentially the same as someone who's retired. So you don't count as part of the labor force, so you're no longer unemployed. So people who are discouraged workers don't count one way or another. Now, this is a big uh, criticism of the way unemployment is officially counted in the United States because what I've been saying a few times is that we're trying to get a measure of the health of the economy through unemployment. Well, if somebody lost their job and then looked for a job for so long that they just gave up, I think we would all recognize that as a problem with employment, a problem with the health of the economy. But the second they stop looking for a job, they no longer count as participating in the labor force, and so they can't be counted as unemployed. And so we're losing something here. We're, we're missing part of the picture if we don't consider discouraged workers. And the unemployment rate does not include discouraged workers. So you might say that the official unemployment rate understates the problem of unemployment by not counting discouraged workers. And I'm going to say that again. The official unemployment rate understates the problem of unemployment by not counting discouraged workers. Now, we do actually keep track of and count the population of discouraged workers, but you have to seek that information. That's not the unemployment rate that you hear about whenever the news announces that the unemployment rate went from 5.3 to 5.2 percent. That rate that you're hearing there, it does not count discouraged workers. You would have to um, 
be savvy enough to realize that, okay, that's good, that's a useful number, but it also, well, what's the amount of discouraged workers? And uh, is that saying something? Because if we've got um, a million discouraged workers out there, then we probably have a bigger problem of unemployment than the official rate might indicate. Okay, everyone who's not in that group is the civilian labor force, and let's return to our illustration. So we built a box around those people who are eligible to be part of the labor force, right? And then I said, hey, but not everybody in that box is actually participating in the labor force. Some of them are homemakers or retired, some of them are full-time students, and some of them are discouraged workers and all the problems that go along with that. So let's just mark off a different population here, outlined in red and shaded. Okay, they don't count as part of the labor force either. So now we're really only talking about people in this box right here. Okay, people who are not shaded in red but are inside the blue square, they are people who are part of the labor force. And so now how, the question is how many of them have jobs? Or really, because we're measuring unemployment, how many people inside this don't have a job? This triangle, that is the whole, right? We started this conversation by saying we need, a, we need a whole. We need the labor force in order to know what percentage of that force doesn't have a job. Well, that's our whole. So what we're going to do now is figure out who, who is part of the labor force actually doesn't have a job. They'll be unemployed. So from the civilian labor force, we want to take away the full-time employees. Of course, if you're a full-time employee, which is defined as 40 hours a week, then you have a job. No big surprise there. So you're not unemployed, right? So if we want to do this as kind of a running thing here, let's say that, okay, maybe half of the labor force, straight up, they've all got jobs, full-time jobs, 40 hours a week. They're not unemployed, are they? No. So what about part-time workers? guess what? They count as just as employed as the full-time workers. Okay, so let's say maybe this many people are part-time workers. Okay, they have jobs. Now, I want you to go ahead and put a star next to this part-time worker thing too because this is another criticism. What if somebody has a part-time job but they would rather have a full-time job and can't find a job? Well, if that's the case, then that would say something about there being a problem, but the unemployment rate, as it's measured, won't capture that. Okay, so similar to the discouraged worker situation, um, whereas with the discouraged workers, they don't count as part of the labor force at all, so they don't count. Part-time workers, even if they would rather be full-time, so they consider themselves underemployed, they just count as employed. And so it looks great, but maybe we've got a lot of underemployed people. The next group are, is an odd category called unpaid family business workers. And this is common in family-run businesses such as restaurants uh, where some pe members of the family work in the restaurant but aren't actually on the payroll. Think of a husband and wife team. Um, a husband's not going to count uh, his wife as an employee if they both run a shop together. Okay, that wouldn't make any sense. You'd be run into payroll taxes and everything else, and they're making the same living. Uh, so there's, there's no need to count this as an employee. However, we're not going to count this person as unemployed because they work every day. And so um, this is kind of an odd category that you run into sometimes, but if you're, you're gainfully employed in the family business, then you, whether you're on the payroll or not, you count as employed. So let's go ahead and just, you know, that's not a very common situation. Maybe that right there. Okay, so now we're, we're narrowing in on our unemployed population. And then finally, if you're on sick leave or you're on strike or you're on vacation, you still have a job. And I'm not going to elaborate too much on that. It's just in case you had any question in your mind, if you're on strike, even if you haven't worked for six months, you still have a job, as long as it's a legally recognized labor dispute. Sick leave even if it's prolonged, might, um, it's, as long as you're not uh, terminated from employment, even if you're on sick leave for a year because your employer allows it, you still have a job. And I don't think anyone thought you lost your job when you went on vacation, um, I guess as long as you told the work you were leaving.
okay? So everybody who is left is now unemployed. So we have this little area right here. I only have maybe four dots in there, and uh, two of them are half cut off. But that's your unemployed population. This is the percentage of this triangle is unemployed. So let's move on now. Okay. Um, who are unemployed? Everybody else. Anybody who's left. And here's the simple rule for unemployment. Now that we've broken every step of the way down, the simple rule is this. You must be looking for a job and not finding one or be in between jobs or changing careers to be unemployed. And remember, we can't count people in the military even though they earn a living because they just don't count as part of the labor force to begin with. They're not even eligible. If you're in prison or institutionalized, doesn't matter. No one expects you to have a full-time job. And if you're under 16, no one expects you to have a job. People who would like to work but have given up looking for a job are discouraged workers and do not count towards unemployment rate. Look, I've said it again. This is an important concept, so you really need to make sure you understand this idea of discouraged workers and remember it. So a few other things to know while we're talking about employment. There's this idea called the labor force participation rate. Um, and let's go back here. I thought I might have something written. So the labor force participation rate is the percentage of people who inside the overall box that I made, the people who are eligible to be part of the labor force, how many of them are actually participating in the labor force? The way that I drew it, I just went half of it diagonally, right? So we would see a labor force participation rate of 50% here. Half of the people who are eligible to participate in the labor force are participating. Why is that important? Well, labor is one of the factors of production, right? Labor is an economic resource. And so you're only you're counting your labor force as as labor in land labor capital entrepreneurship. And so if you have a high non-participation rate of the people who could participate in the labor force, a lot of them aren't. Well, you you have an opportunity to increase your economic resources, push your production possibilities outward and create economic growth. If you can encourage people who are not participating in the labor force to participate. An example of this is uh, in the 60s when women in the United States overwhelmingly transitioned from not participating in the labor force and staying at home to a very high rate of participation in the labor force that we see today. So the labor force participation rate went up in the United States because of women entering the workforce. So this is something that actually led to economic growth. Now the key here was we had uh, the ability and we did actually find employment for all of these new employees who are in the labor force. Just because you enter the labor force doesn't mean you find a job. Let's remember that. So if the economy doesn't find jobs for all of these people, well then you, now you would be increasing your unemployment rate. And that's obviously not a good thing. The next thing is labor productivity versus efficient use of labor. So the bottom line here is you can increase your labor resource by using the labor you have better. But that's a different statement than saying you are putting all of your available labor to work. Okay, Labor productivity is how good or how much does the labor that's being used produce. And if they get more productive, you've increased your production possibilities. Efficient use of labor is how, how much unemployment is there, okay? High unemployment is an inefficient use of labor. There's not being used. And then finally, you've got human capital here, and human capital is a highly misused word, but it, what it means is simple. It's the training and skills of the workforce. It is not a, a measure of the quantity of labor. Or anything like that. So keep that in mind and you'll be okay. Not a quantity of labor, it's the skill of the labor force. That's all for today. Happy studying.